Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's a great honor and privilege uh, for me to welcome you here at the Institute here in Washington, D.C. I actually planned a speech, but at the last minute I decided to improvise. Why? As you know, today's uh, news headlines are what about? About uh, ending government shutdown, uh, overcoming the financial and economic crisis, fighting new threats in the world, about uh, uh, the tragedy in Syria. And uh, our leaders are trying everything they can to find solutions for those issues. At the same time, I really hope that our leaders will never forget that music, art, poetry can get us through hard times. Because this is what I always believe. Ladies and gentlemen, poems are important because they make us think. Poems are important because they open us up to wonder and to sometimes astonishing power of language. <coughs> Some say that poems are important because they are the way to re-engage with a world we take too much for granted. <coughs> and not least, poems are important because they can change your life. They can change your life because they can ch change the way you look at and you listen to the world. That's why I'm more than happy that we are here today to celebrate the William Meredith Award for 2013 to the Bulgarian poet Lumeril Levchev because his poems are really those powerful verses that can change your life. I'd like to stress that the bond between Bulgaria and William Meredith is more than special. And by saying that, please don't take it as a cliche. It has a genuine meaning. We, the Bulgarian people, are grateful for William Meredith, for his deed, for everything he has done to foster the connection between the people of art from the United States of America and Bulgaria. At the same time, we would like to thank Mr. Hartais for his work to continue William Meredith's deed. You know, I was born in a small town on the Bulgarian Black Sea coast called Pomori. And uh, it happened so that uh, this September I had to go back to attend the wedding ceremony of my niece. And there in Bulgaria, I learned that Mr. Hartais had a performance just 50 miles away from my native town. This was a surprise. <laughs> it was on the 20th of September, and I had, had to leave on the 10th. <laughs> Otherwise, of course, I very much would like to be here. But uh, once again, thank you very much for everything you do. Thank you to the William Meredith Foundation. Thank you for you being here for us, uh, with us tonight. And I hope you'll enjoy this wonderful evening. Thank you for your attention. You have programs there. I worked two days to get this program together, and I'm very happy about it. And I hope you'll forgive me. I'm going to be very rude. I'm going to take off my jacket. I am cursed with my mother's metabolism, but I am blessed with my mother's spirit. So forgive me. Just a moment. I get very much. Other 
others may feel free to do likewise. I, I would like to thank very much the Bulgarian Embassy. They've been so cordial to me and William uh, over the years. As you may know, William and I are citizens of Bulgaria by presidential decree. So Ambassador Potorova has been extremely kind, and I should say too that the cultural and political attaché here, uh, Petio Barban, has been extremely helpful in arranging this beautiful room. Um, I'm going to try not to be too long-winded, but I would like to say that we have wonderful sculptures here. Nancy Frankel is the Vice President of the William Meredith Foundation, well, she's the treasurer, which is even more important. And uh, you'll see some of Nancy's beautiful work as you go around the room. Uh, and also the work of a wonderful Bulgarian sculptor, Lucien Lyko, who works in wood in a smallish town called Lugovgrad near the American University. And they're charming, based on folklore, and uh, they're really magical. So there are those. And also here, <coughs> you have etchings by Stoyman Stoilo, he was considered the great Bulgarian master. He was made professor in, in uh, Vienna. Austria declared him professor, which is a kind of honorific title that they give in Europe, apparently. And <coughs> these are etchings which do not illustrate, but they more or less respond to William's poetry and my own. And to make a trifecta, this evening we have beautiful music. Actually, this concert was uh, produced in 2003 for William's birthday. And it went to five American cities and wound up in Varna on the Black Sea at a summer music festival. And so um, we're happy to have here John Bucto, who is the special collections librarian at Georgetown, who just uh, very generously purchased a copy, one of these 30 copies of the Echoes um, etchings. And we have Kate. Kathleen Fitzpatrick, who will be our soprano of the city of Sydney, and the pianist, accompanist, Evo Culture. Their bio biographies are fully listed in the program. Um, before I go into too much more by way of introduction, we have a couple of short films uh, which talk about <coughs> who the narrative was, is this little statue there on the, to the left is in bronze, and it's a model of what stands atop the Connecticut uh, Congress in Hartford. And it's made out of bullets from the, uh, from the Civil War. And when William won the Lifetime Achievement Award from Governor Rell, this is the award that was presented. The other award is the Nikolai Vapsarov Prize that William was given by Bulgaria. It's the highest award. It shows Pegasus, which is the symbol of poetry, and it's cut and with a bullet hole there because the great heroic poet Nikolai Dapsarov was killed during that period. And so this has become the great national poet of Bulgaria, and that's the, the reason why you have take a shot Pegasus there. At any rate, um, Rosen, if you'd be kind enough to play this, these couple films, and then we'll continue the program. So this bridge between our countries is a long established one, and many uh, lucky artists and writers from New London and the area have been sent to Bulgaria, and Bulgarians have come to New London. It's been a great program, largely through the Griffiths Art Center. They're the ones who have the deep pockets, I think, is the cliche. <laughs> At any rate, it's been, it's been a great uh, go, and we hope to continue to work with the foundation. Um, so, for Lubomir, in this is the book, and you'll see copies of it around. Uh, in the program, it mentions to you that uh, the Mystic Seaport did a beautiful uh, leather-bound journal of Williams' poetry. It's a very good collection of Williams' poetry. And uh, there are blank pages for you to write your own poems, and I would encourage each of you to take a copy of that brown leather-bound book in the lobby as you leave. These books uh, are for demonstration. Um, in the 
opening. I'd like to sit down and the secrets. Lubomir came to, to London and lived at the Griffiths Art Center with his wife on several occasions, wrote poems, wrote books of poetry. He appeared here in Washington on a number of occasions. He's a master poet. He's considered uh, the poet laureate of Bulgaria, certainly one of the finest East European poets. He's won many awards, including Might of the French Round Table, the gold medal there, the um, Spanish Prize, and now the William Meredith Prize. And this prize, a word should be said about this, since we're in a political climate and we're discussing politics from the deputy here. Um, William and I used to go to Bulgaria in the dark days before um, the change, as it is euphemistic in terms of the end of communism in that country. And Lubomir and William always felt that if people can't shake hands across borders, political or cultural, there really isn't much hope for any of us. And so despite the, the great differences in our politics, he was able to keep an open channel, as it were, to Bulgaria and vice versa. And so this prize doesn't speak to politics. Lubomir has written three autobiographical novels. In one of them, he says that um, he, I don't want to say he disavows communism, but he does say that it had problems and its faults. On the other hand, when he spoke to Parliament, he said, if I rejected my socialist ideals, I would be spitting on everything I lived for and worked for. And I respect that. So this is not a political prize. This is a prize which recognizes him as a major figure in line with what the deputy ambassador has indicated, what Hillary Clinton talks about in terms of stilling the white noise around us and helping us understand the affairs of the human heart. In my introduction to this book, I say that Levchev's career represents a lifetime of verbal mastery and careful observation. His speech is informed by a metaphorical vision of great beauty and power. It is a unique voice, that of a poet like his native Bulgaria, caught between past and future, <coughs> east and west, who ultimately transcends these polarities. At times sad, bemused, giddy, mystified, awestruck, and wise, it is often, often a lonely voice. And when there is no audience, he is content to sing to the stars. Like Shelley or other great romantics, he speaks to us directly, <coughs> a lyrical leap out of space and time. In the East, it is said that between one person and another, there is only light. The world is brighter for the light that shines in this work. <coughs> I want to read four poems of Lubomir's, if you <coughs> see. It's an odd title, The Green-Winged Horse. Um, but it comes from this little poem. And you'll see the kind of nostalgia. <coughs> I'm very sorry Lubomir couldn't be here tonight. Uh, I've just come back from Bulgaria, where we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Union of Bulgarian Writers and had the 10th annual conference for, uh, it used to be called Peace, the Hope of the Planet, and now it's called The, the Strength and Weakness of Language. It was very interesting, the Greeks, the Albanians, the whole, the whole world was there. It was, uh, you know, for better or worse, there we were. The green winged horse. I often think of these little maple leaves that fly down on little helicopters that we used to put on our nose kids or something. But I think he's talking about a stick the children in Bulgaria pick up and play with, you know, kind of hobby horse sort of thing. <coughs> Green winged horse. And you'll hear the nostalgia of this. And it's deceptively simple and accessible, this poem. I think keep this in mind. He has earned his philosophical vision over years survival. In spring, everything flourishes. Not only flowers and blossoms, but buds and leaves too. Even invisible things flourish, but they are very fragile. 
Little branch broken by the wind. Little branch with two buds and three leaves. I wanted to pick you up from the road where you had fallen before some truck crushed you, but I was afraid they might say I had broken you. I, what a mean coward I was. I walked toward my end without fear. And I feel you dip into my heart as if an antique vase. And I sense how beautiful you are. Little branch, when I fade into the distance, when I become quite little, you'll become my little horse. You'll be my green winged horse. Another. Strange combination, I think, in the way of being green and an echo of the air of the planet, and on the other hand, being a uh, man in a culture for whom deer meat, you know, make sure clothes and food. Uh, when he talks about a little balcony here, it's that kind of hunting blind, you know, you go up a pine tree and nail in a metal platform and you sit there and you watch the deer come down. It's that, it's that hunting line. Gunshot. They left me in a tree on a small balcony among the boughs called a stand. Then the sleigh glided away. The little bells of childhood died away. I was left alone. I was left alone in the last forest of my world. A forest with beasts and forest spirits and silence, resonance, and cold. I felt that I was freezing in the silence. I pulled back the breach and stared through the barrel. And through it, I saw the volcano Fujiyama, the placid sacred mountain. Or perhaps I saw death lying in wait. And since I know that death does not wait long, it has no time. I quickly plucked up my end with two good cartridges for deer. Then I heard the deer drawing near. His horns were crackling through the bush like a rising fire. At the end of the clearing, he looked around and he bowed. I'd say he wished to kiss the earth, but in fact he was looking for the salt. I took aim, held my breath, and the scarlet whip cracked with frightful strength. The deer jumped straight toward the sky like a fountain with whose tap children play. And then it broke down in the snow. Then the mysterious skirmish started. Agony resembling amatory madness. Love with the nothingness. Oh, death. I climbed down from the stand. With the second bullet, I shot him in the head to keep him from spoiling the deer skin. I took out the fuming fired cartridges but dropped them in the blood because right then above me flew the deer's soul. Did the forest groan? The last forest of my world and the exhausted wind. I'll read two more. Having lost my mother in April, this April, this really appeals to me this morning. It's called My Mother in Paradise. The little angels you stitch with what is left of your blue eyes. The little angels such as I myself once was at their age. The little angels, mother, the little angels are waiting for you to stitch the last tiny wing. Then they will begin to sing and will flutter around you. They will turn loose your hair, thin and white, and you'll ascend with them as the saints did. There in paradise will commence your sufferings because in paradise there is nothing that looks like your son. You will fall down before the Almighty's throne. You will wash his feet with your tears, and you will pray to him. You will pray to let you go back home, unseen, just for a minute, to prepare something for my breakfast, to brush my clothes, and to write down on my cigarette pack, come back early. 
The Almighty will smile, although he is also embroidered with the blue of your eyes, and he won't grant you your wish. You will recline alone beneath the blissful palms, and with a hairpin, you'll pierce in the sky a starlet, a secret brilliant star to watch our neighborhood. The windows of the white apartment buildings will light up. In the shadows, couples in love will stand like statues. Women in slippers will go for bread and will call out to their children in a sing-song voice. A caravel will hover above the airport. Invisible trains will whistle through the night. Ah, the whistles of those night trains by which I was always somewhere traveling. You heard them. Listen, listen to them. Hear how they come, hear how they rush, how they roar at the railroad crossing. One of them will be my horse and belated cry for you. graceful circus actors, nor slender-legged steeplechase jumpers. These were war horses, made deaf by guns, blind by fire, horses with spotless honor. Decorated with monstrous wounds, they grazed slowly in an orchard and drank long from the stone trough, their last sacrament before going to paradise. No one shod them anymore. Only the nightingales sang their evening praises, only one very old soldier was detailed to take care of them and, like them, finish his life. His entire family had been killed long before. All of them were buried in his absence, and now he buried the horses like a centaur. He would fire once in the air and make the sign of the cross. There he is in front of the straw hut, well groomed with all his medals and insignia, having passed through all the bloody drums having hidden his pain beneath a simple pride. We, the children, used to bring him cigarettes and matches, which would sweat from our fathers and brothers. But he would accept no presents, so would leave them beside him there on the grass. He recognized our passion for riding, our passion for the frightening, our passion for what was forbidden. And with a simple nod of his head, he would point at the horses allotted to us. The wounded horses would give a gentle lick while we climbed up barefoot by their manes, and they would set forth heavily with a warlike gait. They, for the last time, we, for the first time, happy. We lived long, but we did not grow old. They did not kill us. And now when I hear that Shiva is dancing again, I hear my heart howl distantly and quietly. Captain, it's useless to undergo any treatment. Our flesh isn't even good for horse sausages. And if we survive this battle till the end, make your strange and dangerous gesture. Let us in to die in the garden before paradise. As I say, very accessible, you know, still. Now, this afternoon, Nikolai Petev, who was the chairman of the Union of Bulgarian Writers died. And uh, he was a marvelous man. And so this concert to see, thank you very much. is dedicated to uh, Because of all the action on Capitol Hill, three of our guests weren't able to come, but did send letters which are in your programs. Senator Joe, I mean, Congressman Joe Courtney, 
uh, Congresswoman uh, Lois Frankel, who was a friend and congressman down in West Palm Beach, where William and I lived, and Senator Murphy. But I'll read just one of the letters you have them there in your program. Dear Mr. Levchev, it's my great pleasure to congratulate you on being selected as the 2013 William Meredith Award for Representing the Meredith's former hometown in the U.S. House of Representatives, I want to convey my admiration and that of my constituents in esteem, in, in esteem Connecticut, for your great work, in Eastern, excuse me, Eastern Connecticut, for your great work. As you know, the William Meredith Award for Poetry was established to preserve the legacy of the unique individual and the impact he had on so many lives. Your impressive literary accomplishments have not only moved countless readers, but I've also served as a cultural bridge between Bulgaria and the United States. I could not think of a more appropriate recipient of the William Meredith Award than you. Congratulations again on this honor. I look forward to continuing to read your work, and I wish you the best of luck in your future projects. The other two letters are from our representative. Wish them luck, so they work for your advice, I guess. Um, and finally, I should say that uh, at the concert that we did in Varna, we had the great pleasure of having Ivo Kalcha play the piano. It was a great embarrassment, however. We made a film, a very unofficial film, and the filmmaker took the program and used the pianist, the accompanist, who was scheduled to play. So that's what got into the film. But tonight we have the real McCoy, the real accompanist. And we're very grateful that uh, he's able to join us, as well as Kathleen uh, Fitzgerald, who is, please? Fitzpatrick. Fitzpatrick, she's Fitzpatrick. I'm used to Landry. This is her husband, that's correct. <laughs> this is her stage name, you see. So we were very lucky to have both of these fine, talented individuals put together this program very quickly. And I think we're just going to redo the program from beginning to end. The poems are there in your program, but I encourage you to listen to Kathleen because she does, she is so exact. You'll hear the poems, but they're there if you need to see them. And beyond that, one good thing, the first poem called Tempest Fugit, I wrote for William, uh, what is now 60 years ago. <laughs> but in the poem it says, at, my, at half my age 30 years ago, you fool, so it should be, well, you get the map, it's wrong. It should be. <laughs> At my age, 60 years ago, he flew among the stars. William was a pilot in World War II in Korea. So I won't make it out of stock now. And I'll let Kathleen and Evil begin what I'm sure is going to be a wonderful presentation of eight songs. Thank you.
nothing but in things.
is the uh, subject of the next three songs that came to the same with different proposals.
country and that the men to have that all put together like in a few weeks' time. I mean, just to do that. So, another round of applause. So, that's our program. Yeah, there's a little wine left, I think, and I'm more than happy to relax a little bit with you. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. And take a look at the sculptures. And don't forget to take the leather-bound books. These others are for demonstration. The green ones are books. Okay, thank you. Good night.